Welcome to the Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode 15. We are shy of Danilo this week, so I'll be taking the lead. Uh, but I think our guest will more than make up for it. We are joined by Ben Stone, uh, also possibly better known as the Bad Quaker. Uh, he is the operator of badquaker.com and also a regular co-host on the Freedom Fiends. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Ben. Uh, hey, thanks just- for having me on. Uh, before we get before we get into things, I just want to mention that the Seeds of Liberty podcast is covered by the BIPCOT No Gov license. This allows reuse by anyone, except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about that at BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango dot org. All right, so Ben, uh, I, th- I think this week we're going to be talking about the backfire effect, uh, but we usually do ask our guests. Uh, to give a little information about themselves, if you don't mind, uh, for people who may not know about you yet. Uh, if you want to fill us in with some things, and uh, then we'll get started. Sure. Um, I'm an old guy. Uh, I'm really <laughs> old. <laughs> um, and getting older every day. Um, my wife and I are retired. We kind of roll around the countryside in our really nice RV. We uh, wasted our retirement f- uh, fund on that to have that and to well not all of our retirement fund we still have enough to live on but uh, we just move around from place to place and hopefully avoid government as much as possible and uh, and I stay as you know by being mobile like that I can poke at the state from different directions and hopefully not uh, uh, feel the wrath of it if it ever figures out where I'm at and comes after me <laughs> but I, I don't have too much fear about that I'm a pretty minor cog in a giant wheel of all of us. You what's know? what's the what's the general thought? You know, the state doesn't care what you're what you do is as long as you're not gonna put any action behind it. As yeah. far as violence, they don't really care. You can the slave can cry all he wants, right? Yep, very true. Um you have to annoy way you know, I I look at uh, this is way off the any topic that we might touch, but I look at um the possibility of feeling government wrath uh, on, on different levels. Like the first level, probably the most likely is dealing with a cop. He's having a bad day. He's not, you know, uh, he's just a bad attitude or whatever, and you got to deal with him. But if you imagine all government agents on all levels are essentially the same as a cop, you know, you could cross one accidentally at any particular level, and he just decides, hey, you know, I work for the government. I can do anything I want and get away with it. And, you know, they're all just as dangerous as that cop on the street who's having a bad day who didn't get his donut today. It's just, they're, you know, they're all on different levels. And we don't interact with all of them as often as we interact with cops because they're everywhere. I don't know. <laughs> How dare you strike a king's servant? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's funny you say that, though, because, you know, you're talking about trying to stay out of their path as much as possible, which I, I think most of us uh, are, are keenly aware of doing at all times. Um, but I actually, I actually had a situation, uh, what was that, yesterday, where I, I actually had to legitimately break into a client's house because a lock on their door had engaged that had never engaged before and they were out of town and I had to get in and I had their permission to use a, a ladder and climb it through their window, but even they warned me. They said, are you sure you want to do this? Because if the men in uniform show up, that's, they're, an old, they're, an old, they're an old hippie couple. Um, that's how they refer to them, the men in uniform. Um, if, they, if they show up, uh, you know, we're not there, so you may want to be careful. <laughs> and it's like, I actually tweeted about it. It's like, it's kind of scary that you actually are doing something you have permission to do, and you still have to have that fear in the back of your head. Like, what if you, what if you do, one, one, one passes by who is having a really bad day. Uh, and it's just looking for somebody to take their anger out on. It's like it's like running a stoplight or a stop sign in the middle of the, you know, <laughs> b- bum freaking Egypt. <laughs> no one around for miles and you're still like, oh, God, did anybody see me? I think deep down inside, everybody knows, you know, you're driving along, you're you're minding your own business, you're below the speed limit, you've got your lights correct and everything's right. And a cop, you suddenly look up in your rearview mirror and there's a cop right there. Nobody that I've ever encountered goes, oh, I'm so happy there's a cop right behind me. Everybody just gets that feeling in their stomach like, oh, crap, I don't want that, you know, don't look at me. Maybe I can turn here. Can I just go into a parking lot, do anything to keep that guy 
from because you know who knows what he's thinking who knows what his day is like and he might and, be bored <laughs> yeah uh and and who knows what's going to trigger him and i think deep down inside even the most hardcore statist feels that when the cop is right behind him in the rearview mirror they just don't want to admit it well when you rule by fear that's that's the response you get yeah it's the response you're looking for so <laughs> yeah, obe yeah. obedience yeah. and fear yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I see a cop behind me, I just I get in the uh, slow lane and I outslow them. I make them pass me. <laughs> but I drive the speed limit everywhere I go because I'm paid hourly and I'm in no rush. <laughs> yeah, well, you you have that advantage. I, I I'm I'm employed by myself and my 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 business depends on me being able to hustle. So <laughs> I don't have that luxury. I just I have I have my radar detector and, and ways going on my phone at all times. <laughs> Well, I have and the radar head, detector. My head's but, on a swivel. <laughs> you know, they they fly planes out over some of the interstates here, so it doesn't matter what radar you got. Um, so, I guess I'll give a little back uh, or background on what the backfire effect is before we get into it. Um, something I found the other day. I, I I don't know why I was just looking through. It. Maybe someone on Reddit said something about it or or something. But I just wanted to define what the backfire effect is and why this is a common problem for anyone speaking uh, what they consider the truth or, or want people to realize something that they've found you know a viable knowledge to, to have this uh, the backfire effect occurs in the face of contradictory evidence established beliefs do not change but actually get stronger the effect has been demonstrated experimentally in psychological tests where subjects are given data that either reinforces or goes against their existing existing biases. In almost all cases, people can be shown to increase their confidence in their prior, prior position regardless of the evidence they are faced with. This makes most re refutations useless. So when you're debating with someone and they just keep hammering down on the same point, to continue the charade is pointless, right? Yeah, and I, I think we've all seen that to a certain extent in social media you know where where somebody says something and and and, and a, a, a conversation begins to engage and you see that moment when they just lock their heels down and they're not going to be budged and they're not going to look at your references and they're not going to accept any premise that you might have and they just start spouting fallacies and they start spouting slogans and you know at, at that point in time a, the the astute observer should recognize that this person is not going to budge. They just lock themselves into their position, and it doesn't matter, you know, if, if they're arguing there's no such thing as a tidal wave, and there's a tidal wave that's coming down on them and they're already feeling the water, they're still going to deny it. It's They just lock into their position and they're not going to budge. Yeah, that's why, you know, what I would say is my approach has changed. I think Ben saw it. I had him tagged in a a little bit of a back and forth with a guy a few weeks ago and uh, I wasn't confrontational at all I only asked the guy questions and made him <laughs> prove his point and even then he was basically like you don't know what the hell you're talking about I've been this for X years I know this because <laughs> I've studied this and it's like you know it's um it's more of a philosophical point I take on things it's it's stop knowing and start asking you know the minute you think you know something you've you you've allowed your brain to go dead on any you know x subject you know well something you touch there is using the socratic method where you instead of trying to tell them something you ask them questions that force them to to give an answer that's going to make them think and sometimes doing that that's a very effective means uh, but sometimes in doing that um, it will generate so much anger on the part of the other person because you are actually forcing them to think about what they're saying. Um, and, and of course the fun side of that is, uh, you know, that if there's anybody else who's watching, there's a real good likelihood that they're going to see that, you know, I'm just asking you a question and look how you're reacting to it. Or I'm just asking you a question, why won't you answer that question? And anybody viewing that will... Uh, very often see the, the fallacy of the other person's position. But there's a counter effect to this too. And I think, 
you know, if if I can put on my foil hat for a moment, uh, the um, we know we know for a fact that the government has engaged lots and lots and lots of people to go on uh, social media. I mean, this is all the documentation is all out there. This is not, you know, this is not craziness or anything. But they have engaged a lot of people to go on social media and make arguments for pro-government positions, and so. You know, one of the things that I have observed in that kind of a situation is that if they can get the conversation so convoluted and so many different, like if they can throw 20 questions at you before you can uh, address one thing, and it becomes obvious that they're just filling the thread with, you know, hammer hits, bam, 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 and it, it becomes... A wearisome for the side observer to go through and read every single one of those and it drives away the audience so all they're really doing in, in that case they're kind of using the backfire effect against you they're not coming at it looking for the truth they're 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 trying to get you to uh, to go into a position where you get so frustrated with yourself that you say something you that you uh, revert to name-calling or some of the other fallacies that we're so familiar with and then they can, you know, feel like they've achieved something because they got you to then call them names. I don't know if I talked that in a circle or not, but, I, but my main point was that it's according to who you're dealing with. If you're dealing with an honest person who's just uh, confused on a topic and they can, you know, uh, you can talk to them about it, uh, that's one thing. But if you're talking to somebody whose job it is to engage you, waste your time, and fill a thread with nonsense so that they can make you look like an idiot, you're never going to win that uh, argument anyway, and you're not going to win the first one. So in a sense, like like my standard is, if I can't get to them within a couple of uh, a couple of statements, if I see them lock up or if I see them throw up those blinders and and go into that mode, I just Blaze stop. over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just stop because now it's a waste of my time. And they're if if they're a pro, they're going to try to make me look bad. If they're not a pro, I'm not going to convince them of anything anyway. Yeah, that uh, <clears throat> that makes sense. Although I, I I never take that advice. I say it to myself all the time. I should, um, but you know, one of the other things you actually touched on earlier is the reason that I continue going, and that's the the you know the people watching in the in the wings that aren't saying you know that aren't typing or aren't saying anything, uh, depending on the situation. Uh, I've I, I have a tendency to spend a lot of time on social media just because my job, I, you know, I'm out walking dogs half the day, um, and uh, it gives me a lot of time <laughs> to be able to play on the phone while I'm wandering around. Um, so I engage in a lot of these conversations, and I say it all the time because I get people that ask me, you know, why do you waste your time with these people? Why do you keep going? Because there's been, there's been conversations that clearly it wasn't going anywhere from, you know, the third or fourth line. But I continued on because I know, number one, that I, I won't let myself get rustled by anybody. So I, I don't have that fear of slipping into the frustration and the ad hominems um, like I used to. But <laughs> I, I, I really, my, my intended target is almost never the person I'm talking to. You know, if, if somebody wants to engage me, I first of all assume that it's a, uh, a government troll. Mm -hmm. uh, just off the bat, because like you said, it, it really doesn't matter whether they're trying to, you know, either way you're going to end up in that, you may end up in that position. <laughs> so I just treat everybody like they could be. Uh, and my, uh, my, target my target audience is always actually the rest of the people that aren't chiming in, um, because I do exactly as you said, I'll, I'll just keep asking the questions. Um, I just had this happen the other night where this guy just kept going and going and he just kept wanting to recite constitutional rhetoric to me. Like that's all he had to say. <laughs> and all I wanted him to do was answer the question, how do you delegate a right to another that you don't possess yourself? That's all I wanted him to do. And he just refused <laughs> to answer the question. Well, you, you see, they answer that question, their entire argument goes to shit. Yes, I know, but that's the point. <laughs> they, I, they know I, that, though. Yeah. <laughs> hey, when, you, when you've got, all right, so my goal in a debate or any kind of discussion, because we're not talking about a political debate where your goal is to destroy the other person's argument. We're we're talking about a debate of ideas here where you're trying to get that person to come to your realization, right? Um, my goal in a debate is get someone out of the assertion phase, or what I call the assertion phase, into the honest question phase, where they drop the, the, the castle doors and they say, okay, explain this to me. I have this question. And they answer, you, you answer, and 
you have a back and forth on on maybe that answer instead of this well no this is what this is this is the truth no this is what i uh, this is what my pastor told me this is what the teacher told me this is what my dad told me it it, it you get you get them out of that into that question phase that's the hard part yeah that's really true um and and actually that's like that's like the gold standard of conversation right there when you can see that that person's you know that they first throw out like you know well you just hate roads or whatever some stupid argument like this or or you know well the second amendment gives me that right or whatever and if you can do what you're talking about there and you get it to the point of where they actually consider and say well really but what do you what about this or what about that and if you can get them to asking you a question then it's like i mean that's like gold you've got it you win because now you can explain it you know you explain your position to them because the vast majority i find the vast majority of these people especially on the internet they already think they know your position and they think your position is stupid Boy, do they <laughs> they think you just sit around eating rocks all day because you're so dumb you know and they think, well, all I have to do is tell them without the government, we wouldn't have roads. And that's it. You know, I got them. That's it. Like, that's what are you, thing. stupid? People would shoot each other. Yeah, yeah. It's like, they do be... that now. <laughs> <laughs> without the police, people would just go in and kill each other. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, my. With the, without, the, without the police, there, there would be rape would come back. Oh, no, yeah. wait a minute. It, it never went away. Um, yeah. It's actually worse because of the police. <laughs> or, did, you, uh, uh, did you hear... Um, the whole police. Uh, uh, Tom Woods' podcast the other day was talking about the police uh, kill to per one hundred thousand ratio is higher than in America is higher than any country in the world that that, that runs those statistics. It's higher than Uganda uh, civilians. It's higher than Somalian civilians. It's higher than Honduran citizens, which Honduras has the highest uh, killed per one hundred thousand uh, in the world. Um, and uh, and if you was to just take American cops per 100,000 to per what they kill, it is astronomically like it, it, it beats Honduras by like 10. So when someone's sitting there telling me we need the cops, I'm like, do you actually understand what like do you understand all encompassingly or do you just kind of have assertions that you've bought into about the police? And that throws them further into the backfire effect that we're trying to uh, circumvent here and you know we've got to find different approaches to ideas that we have the facts you know the facts you know unless you're in a court case they don't matter <laughs> right. like the, uh, you're, you're not appealing to someone's uh, like I was saying before we started recording when you're debating someone who's been indoctrinated for a majority of their life you're not debating them you know it's it's like you're running it's like the village the show the village or the movie the village is like you run into the village and saying hey there's an outside world out here and them going, no, 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 no. The elders, they said that there's no outside village here, and they're right. So I don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. So it's, you're not debating that person on the prospect of there being something outside of the village. You're debating what they've been told their whole life. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, uh, you're debating what their parents taught them. You're by telling them that they're wrong. You're telling them that everything, all their whole world of reality, is based on a lie, which it is. Um, but you're, but you're, you know, you're going against what grandma told them, and you're going against what their favorite uncle, Uncle Bill told them, and you're, you know, you're insulting their great heroes that they've built up in their in their minds. But Abraham Lincoln could walk on water. Don't you know that? No. You know. I mean, you're you're just you're breaking things that are you're breaking things on their knickknack shelf in their mind that are precious to them, and they that that's beyond what they can handle. Yeah, I mean, I, it's it's funny because I like I, I go into most conversations knowing this already because you know as as we've been talking about most of you know we deal with this on a regular basis. Um, and uh, I still try, and then I then I have to remember back to to where I was and say, okay, well, I used to be that stupid too, so maybe I should cut maybe I should cut him a little slack. But then it still kicks in. It's like, well, wait a minute, I was that stupid and I overcame it. So <laughs> if I can do it, anybody can. And then it's like it's that battle that rages in my head where I want to force things. You know, um, 
I, I have to deal with it, un unfortunately, um, quite often with my wife, um, because she is uh, she was never really a, a political person. Um, she was more apolitical than anything, and she actually has a lot of libertarian leanings. But she was brought up by a cop. She was raised by a cop. Oh. Uh, so yeah, and uh, we obviously don't get along, uh, <laughs> and try and and trying to get her her to see you know. The uh, the backfire effect definitely kicks in. It's funny, and now I have a name for it um, that I've learned about. <laughs> yeah, what, what did I say I today? I was it. somebody said something to me today. I said I'm not going to sit here and fight backfire effect. Okay, look, I'm a voluntarist. Since I found voluntarism, I'm a more happy and more just all around better person. All right. If you want to learn about this, here's some things. I linked them, and I said, I'm not responding to anything else you say, and I didn't. So I said, send me a message if you have any questions. So we'll see. Yeah, it's really difficult. Uh, you know, I've, I've often, I've kind of said this in different directions, and I've wondered how, I know there's truth to it, but I wonder how deep the truth is. You know, I say this pretty frequently, actually, that, uh, you know, you don't really realize how important air is until you can't get any of it. And then all of a sudden, if you can't get air, it becomes the most important thing, period. Nothing else matters. Pain doesn't matter. You know, nothing matters except if, if you can't get air, you have to have air right now. And freedom is a lot like that. And I sometimes wonder, is it possible to get people to understand their need for freedom until that point that the boot is on the back of their neck and they're having their face ground into the pavement, you know, is there some point ahead of that that you can sit down and logicalize with someone? Like you're talking the old fish and, and not, know, not knowing what the sky is kind of a thing. Is it possible to sit down with this fish and explain to him that if you just swim up toward the light and you just poke your head through, you'll see what I'm talking about. But if you never do that, you'll never see. And I don't know. I don't know if you, if it's something that that has to be that they have to feel that boot in order to recognize that there is such a thing as freedom and that there is such a thing as slavery. You know, uh, it, it's kind of foreign for me because, you know, I was, uh, I in in my in my heart of hearts, I was an anarchist as a kid. I hated teachers. I hated school. I hated me being too. told what to do. You know. And the, my first encounters with cops were all negative. I always felt like, who do you think you are? I mean, that was just my, my impression in the first few times I dealt with cops. And so I didn't fully put it together as far as like not voting and stuff. That took a long time. That actually took my daughter, my adult daughter, sitting me down and confronting me Socratic, Socratically and asking me questions that I couldn't uh, deal with in any other way. And then I had to abandon voting as well. I was like, I was like one of these libertarian anarchists who's not really an anarchist because you still, somewhere in the back of your mind, want to fix things by voting. And it, and it really took her sitting me down and, and really forcing me to say out loud what I believed in order to, for me to understand what it was that I really believed and how silly it is to think that I can use the government to fix the government. Well, that, that's the same thing I, I say to, you know, Rand Paul supporters is like, oh, but Rand Paul's going to get in and he's going to he's going to make he's going to make he's going to perfect rape. <laughs> and and I go, I go, I don't want rape perfected. I want rape to be as nasty and brutal and ugly as it is. So everyone fucking sees it. Yeah, I that's honestly, like you said, it's such a individual thing you have to feel it for yourself and you can sit there and tell someone to their blue in the face that you should be free and they'll say no i shouldn't until that boots on their neck like you said and then they come running back saying oh i was wrong you know fuck the government blah 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 it's like if you could have just seen that maybe i was right and maybe questioned yourself like i said earlier quit knowing and start asking even when you think you have something figured out one hundred thousand percent God is real. The Bible says it. All right. Question everything. All right. Do not end your search for knowledge ever. And that's, I think that's the way you've got to train people in a way to say, hey, maybe you should question these things instead of, hey, you have to accept these things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, uh, I know um, a lot of uh, libertarian leaning and, and, uh, and, and cap type people, 
um, really look to the next generation and say, well, we have to, you know, raise our children understanding to question these things, raise our children without violence, raise our children to expect, uh, you know, freedom and expect peace. And, and I agree with all that. I, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with all that. But I think there has to be a second element as well. It can't just be that they all, uh, y you know, I kind of get the, the image from um, what was that time machine where the people on the surface were totally peaceful and totally without any aggression of any kind. Uh, and, and yet they still were preyed upon by the, you know, by the, the uh, ground dwellers that would come up and eat them. And I kind of imagine that that's, that's sort of the libertarian dream of you know raising our children and doing all this exactly right and then they all just hold hands and walk along by the stream and everything's fine but the state is still going to devour them I, you know, I think there's this second component that you have to recognize the government for the evil that it is and you have to um, expose that as what it is and if it weren't for that you know I would just go all right fine I'm just gonna I've already raised my kids now I'll just go and you know hang out at the beach and watch the sunset and not worry about the rest of this because I've done my my part my job's done I raised my kids they're all three anarchists I'm done you know <laughs> but but I can't leave it at that I gotta go you know pick at the beast poke at it uh, yeah absolutely I mean I, I, I too am on, you know I'm on board with the whole you know, I, I mean, what do they, they call it? The peaceful parenting now or whatever, you know, teaching them not to use violence um, unless, you know, in self-defense, which unfortunately I have to deal with already. I, I have three and a half, almost four year old twins and uh, I'm, I already need to teach them about self-defense because they like beating the heck out of one another <laughs> and one won't retaliate. And I'm like, no, no, it's OK. You can hit her now. It's fine. Um, <laughs> but you're right. It's you know, it, it's one thing. I mean, you know, you can go out and have a brood of your own. You know, you could go back old school and start popping out kids left and right and you know have your own baseball team worth of a little anarchist at home um <laughs> but that still doesn't change the other people and what you're saying I, I think you're right because the people that really believe that that's the one and only method that's going to get us there and is you know the only thing that needs to be done i mean most of them will say oh we we realize it's going to take you know you know i hear people say 100 200 years somewhere in that neighborhood um which yes if people started raising their kids you know, peacefully and, and enough of them did over the generations, it probably would take at least that long. But that idea to me is it's an almost it's like a peaceful eugenics doing it just that way <laughs> and not trying to fix the other people and, and just saying, yeah, they'll all die off eventually. But unfortunately, as we do often have to explain to statists who automatically assume that, you know, when we say stuff like, you know, we don't need cops, you know, you could get private defense and they freak out because all, all the bad people they expect there. Well, nowadays most of the bad people are in government but those other ones do exist and will always exist short mm -hmm. of full-scale eugenics so that just as you said you know you can teach all these kids these 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 tenants um but in the end it, there's still going to be those bad people and if there's enough of them they will overtake them in a hurry um and we won't get anywhere so i, I think you're absolutely right i think uh, i mean I, we do have to we, we have to we have to attack it in the present as much as possible too um, you know, some people aren't really up to that, and that's fine. If if you don't, if you just you know want to do your own thing and 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 pray and pray on the peaceful parenting method is is what you, all you're going to do. You know, we need that too. But there definitely has to be people out there pushing back and challenging. And um, you know, I, I do it as as often as I can. It drives my wife nuts because she wishes I wouldn't. But uh, <laughs> I do I do like to poke the beast as much as possible. <laughs> yeah, I um, I mean, I think two things are not evident to the most of the populace right now um, that really are a win for us uh, in the, the, the hardcore libertarian camp is that technology is advancing faster than government can handle. Yeah. Uh, and they, they, they honestly can't stop it, uh, especially if that worldwide free internet comes out. Um, that's, uh, you're talking North Korea, Russia, China, they can't censor the internet because, oh, hey, I can just pop my cell phone on and, you know. So, technology and spreading ideas is, or how you can spread ideas through technology is, is just astounding at this level. Uh, you know, the news cycle has gotten so short, people forget things a day after it happens. You know, this kid just shot up a black church 
no one will remember that in a week. So this technology is just destroying these, this control to push a narrative that the government has so desperately clang on to for years and years and years and years. Uh, you mix that with uh, people have seen and they have the facts now to support that socialism um, and large-scale collectivization has, has failed miserably for the human experience. They have fact to back that up. I mean, even Russia is, one could say, in a full-scale retreat from any kind of uh, hardcore, you know, truly, truly evil uh, authoritarianism. I mean, they're still very authoritarian, but they're, they're retreating because they see that the more freedom you give people, the better. And something Ben said the other day on, on, on the radio really blew my mind. I'm pretty sure it was Ben was talking about how the Jews weren't actually slaves. They were tax slaves. Yeah. And that really fucking 100% blew my mind. One, like I've, I've never heard that because every, you know, Charleston Heston movie you see and every other romanticized Jewish plight stories you hear, it's they were whipping and beating and killing the Jews, uh, the Egyptians were. And it's... Uh, I kind, kind of eye opening. I kind of hate to take it in this direction. I, I, I shouldn't say I hate to. I, I'm hesitant, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know, <laughs> if, if we, uh, if you consider the folks, and I'm not saying this derogatory. I, I, I literally love some of the people up in New Hampshire in the Free State Project. They, they, some of the most important people in in my life are up there, and I love what they're doing and everything like that. But if you listen to the general language that they use. Like if one of them will get pulled over and let's say their car is impounded uh, temporarily and let's say that they're uh, taken into custody temporarily, well, the terminology that they will use up there in the Free State Project, uh, and I shouldn't say that, I should say those people that are in New Hampshire that have moved there for liberty, but because some of them aren't technically in the Free State Project. But anyway, the, t the terminology they will use, they will say, this costumed guy... Uh, put a gun to their head and threw them in a cage and stole their truck. Now, so if they're telling the story using that terminology, technically they're correct on everything they said. It was a, it was a guy in a costume. He did have a gun. He did throw them in a cage. He did, you know, he did steal their truck. But if you use different terminology that most people use, then actually it was just a, you know, it was a traffic stop. The guy was pulled over. His truck was impounded for 24 hours. It cost him a bunch of money. You know, and then you think back, okay, now let's go back a couple thousand years, 3,000 years, 2,500 years, whatever it was, 2,700 years. And you think about if you're going to be telling a story about those evil Egyptians, and here you are, you know, uh, you're the good guys, you're the, the Hebrews trying to get out of this bad tax situation. The, the terminology that you use is going to be hyperbolic. Is that the right word? Mm -hmm. It's going to be as derogatory as possible towards the bad guys as you're telling the story. So, you know, I, I, every time I say something bad about the wording used in the Bible, <clears> I, I get some hate mail and I get some really upset people with me. And, you know, they, they tell me they'll never listen to me again or whatever. And that's fine. But, I, but whenever I read the Bible, I always try to keep in mind that it's coming from a particular set of salesmen that are selling one particular view. And so when I'm reading the, the Jewish story of leaving Egypt and all of that, then, then I try to keep in mind that that's what I'm, I'm looking at it exactly through the eyes of the people who are wanting me to hear their story in one particular way. And then you look at actual Egyptian history on it, and there's almost nothing there. There's almost no references at all. Why is that? Because the way the Egyptian kings dealt with bad publicity was just to not have any publicity at all, no record of the bad publicity, and anybody who had the guts to go ahead and write it down someplace, they'd just kill him and wipe out the, the record. So, you know, so there's nothing from the Egyptian side of the story. The only story that we have is the uh, Israelite story. And so you, you have to kind of read between the lines to get it. Uh, what was his name? Robert Laferve? Lefer, Robert? Laferve. Yeah, he had a really good story about Joseph. It's over at the Mises Institute somewhere. And um, uh, that was a real eye-opener for me. I actually heard that the first time when I was a kid in the 60s because my dad listened to his radio station or radio show. <laughs> and I wow. heard that uh, back then. 
and it was at the time frame when the church that my parents went to actually played the movie uh, The Ten Commandments, the Charlton Heston version. And so, you know, within, uh, I would say, six months or, or so of seeing the movie at church with Charles Charlton Heston, and then I'm seeing, I'm hearing on the radio this guy talking about it, and I'm like, you know, this sounds a whole lot more like the real story than the Charlton Heston one. Uh, that Because that one is almost, uh, I mean, if you really look at it, it's, very car- it's a very cartoonish version of the story. But, but then again, let me change directions with all that uh, so that it's not just, uh, uh, you know, picking on my translation of the Bible, which, again, people get really mad at me about. But um, going back to, you know, whatever form of activism, whether you're engaging somebody on social media or whether you're, uh, you know, whether you're raising your children, uh, hoping that eventually enough generations of good people will, will produce a good result or whatever. I think one of the flaws that we all have a little bit within, if I can collectivize the entire liberty movement and libertarians and anarcho-capitalists, and uh, I think one flaw that is very rampant among all of us, speaking for myself as well, is that we have a tendency um, to think that whatever the type of activism that we do is, it's a split thing. We either feel like, well, we're just not doing anything. I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing what I could be doing. And, and we feel bad about it, we want to do more, or the other side of it, anybody who's not doing the exact same activity that I'm doing is doing it wrong. So, you know, um, uh, in, in New Hampshire, they're putting chalk on sidewalks, and they're getting a lot of attention doing that. But if you're not putting chalk on a sidewalk in Memphis, then you're just doing it wrong. Or if you're not chalking a sidewalk in Atlanta, then you're doing it wrong. And And there's kind of that mentality. And it's like, you know, you see that kicking back to the free state project you see that a little bit with some of the people up there it's like well it doesn't matter what you're doing if you're not in new hampshire you're doing it wrong and i think that mentality really hurts us i think we really need to realize that every time we engage somebody on facebook yeah we're not just sitting in our mom's basement late yapping on the you know on the internet we're actually doing stuff we're engaging people we're tr- we're working for that audience for the 20 people or the two people that might read our engagement in, you know, on Facebook or on Twitter or whatever the thing is. We're working for that person so that, you know, the, the guy, I, oh, here, here's, a, here's a good example. I was at uh, Libertarian Party's um, little doodad that they had in Pennsylvania a few years back. And uh, um, Larkin Rose was there and a couple other really good hard hitters were there. And I was doing my little speech. And as I was doing my speech, um, they were cleaning up from the dinner. You know, the, the Libertarian Party had this big dinner, and so I was talking at the end of the dinner, and the waiters were coming in cleaning up the tables. And one of the waiters, uh, I, I had said something, I can't even remember the thing that I'd said, but I was talking to the Libertarian Party members, essentially telling them that voting is a waste of their time and it's not going to get them what they think that it's going to get them which is really, you know, not a message that 80-year-old libertarians in a, in a meeting want to hear. So they were giving me the look uh, during this time. But this waiter who's picking stuff up off of one of the tables literally stops and turns around and looks at me. And so I'm looking and I'm talking at the 80-year-old libertarians in the Libertarian Party. But I'm really aiming that at the waiter that's back there in the back. And I'm really making my discussion for him, and I'm talking about Bitcoin, and I'm talking about, you know, it, it, the problem is, is not going to get solved by going to government and asking government to fix what's wrong with the Federal Reserve. The way to get this thing done is to act like there is no Federal Reserve, to build a system that's resilient and that can go around the Federal Reserve and that can do everything that you need, not what, you, not what government wants it to do, not what the bankers want it to do, but what we need it to do and do it without the Federal Reserve. And that's what the blockchain can do, whether you're locked into Bitcoin or anything else. And this, I could tell this waiter had, he, he was hearing things that not only did they resonate with him, but he had never heard anything like that before. And once I got done, I knew that the LP members that I was talking to 
were just going to walk over to the people who had sponsored me to be there and said, don't have that. You know, I knew they did this. This is my imagination. I don't have facts. But, but in my mind, I'm pretty sure they went over there and said, don't have that guy back here again, period. We don't want to see his face never again. And that's okay because I know that waiter heard me because later on, I'm, I'm giving another talk later that evening and way in the back, sneaking in from the back and not even sitting down, just sneaking in the back, there's that waiter. Hmm. And he had, he had got off work and came around and figured out where I was talking next and went to a totally different room in the hotel, and he's hiding in the back listening to me. And we got to imagine that to be the case with every Twitter conversation, every Facebook conversation. You know, I used to do, I was in an uh, online game, a massive multiplayer online game back in the late 90s, uh, round 2000, I think is when I stopped playing it. But I was one of the moderators in there. And I would engage people talking about the gold standard and about, um, about real money. And I was using this game as the platform uh, because in the game, gold was money. So, uh, and, the, and the owners of the game, the programmers and the, the actually wrote the game, they, they would get worried about the economy of the game every now and then, and they would dump a bunch of free gold into the game thinking they were helping people, thinking they were helping, uh, actually, they thought they were helping the newbies by just dumping gold into the game and giving, you know, essentially free gold to the new people that were coming in who didn't know how to make, uh, you know, make money. But what they didn't understand is every time they did that, they blew prices out the window. They fouled up everything all across the board, and the whole economy of the game would suffer for weeks to try to absorb this, you know, this giant dump of money that they put into it. And every time they did that, I was able to engage in conversation the old-time players who just had, you know, they, let's say they had two million pieces of gold in their bank account, and that two million pieces of gold overnight became worth about the equivalent of a hundred pieces of gold. And I could engage them in that and talk to them about it. And, and that was the platform that I was using. So I guess my point in that is that we have to understand that there, that there is an endless supply of different ways to get this message across. And it's not always to the guy that we're talking to. So often, there's all kinds of people who are listening on the side that we don't even know are there, or you know, maybe they're just maybe they'll pick this up later. Maybe they'll see it in some kind of archive or something like that. And that's why it's uh, it's so important to be doing this work. That that's the that's the hint. Hence the name of this show. <laughs> <laughs> That's, seeds of yes exactly that's that's what that's our only goal is is to be non-confrontational not say anything too radical i mean i know i sometimes go off the deep end <laughs> sometimes. Um, <laughs> most of the times but uh if your cognitive dissonance never takes a hit to where so 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 devious and so maniacal that uh you have to uh eventually question it then you're going to be stuck fitting you know the narrative that your brain has made for the rest of your life um, so you may get pissed off and huffy puffy and the backfire effect comes in and you build your castle walls higher, but I've planted my seed inside of your castle. Yeah. You know, I think Jeremy was saying too, a minute ago about, uh, Russia and China and stuff. I think that was Jeremy that said that. Um, and I wanted to throw this out too. you know, anybody who's out there who's creating media, uh, just like this show. And, you know, there's so many podcasts and so many different things on Skype and, you know, uh, little, I'm uh, not Skype, I'm sorry, YouTube and, and all the different places like that, little videos that, that people have put together. Um, one thing that I saw with my Bad Quaker podcast was that I would get randomly out of nowhere massive amounts of downloads from China. And I never understood this. Uh, I, I, one time um, I, I saw that my site was getting hit really heavy. This was, I was up at like one o'clock in the morning or something, and I saw that my site was a little slow, and I went into the stats to see what was going on. And I was taking serious hits from China. And over the course of uh, a few hours, I can't remember the exact numbers now, but I had one particular podcast that went a little bit viral in China, and I got 20,000 downloads within a, a, like a six hour time frame or something like that. And they were coming, you know, in the stats, you can see where this is coming from. They weren't coming from Google. They weren't coming from, uh, they were coming from email hits. So somebody, there was a viral email of some kind that was going on in China. 
and there was people in Beijing, almost all the hits were coming from Beijing, and they were getting that email, following the link on the email, coming back to my website, and going so far as to download an entire podcast. And you think about it, you think about the quantity of people in China, and you think about, you know, in the time frame in the United States between, say, I'm going to say around 2004 to 2012, when a lot of liberty activity took place and Ron Paul, you know, all that activity took place and, and there was, you know, Peter Schiff and there was, uh, there was just a, a Tom Woods uh, a blossom during that time frame and there's so many really important stuff that was going on in that time frame and it just kind of gave birth to this whole thing that we see now of the, what some people call the liberty movement. Just imagine what something like that in China could do. And, and, you know, if we think about, like, in the United States, how many of us are there really? There might be, on the low end, I'm going to be real conservative and say, I'll bet among ANCAPs, hardcore libertar libertarian, tuned in, turned on, dropped out ANCAPs, I'll bet there's close to 100,000 of us at least, and there might be a million. There might even be more than that. Mm. But you think about what could happen in China just if they pick up the right podcast, the right, the right thing that hits them in such a way that it becomes that viral thing and it takes off and it fits the, the, little, uh, the little need that's, that's over there at that particular time. You think about the wildfire that could start over there from something like that, literally a, a seed making a grove making a forest you know it's just the mind boggles at it and it and it can happen with any podcast at any time we never you never know like you think of youtube and you think of some of the really crazy viral videos you know some cat playing the piano or some stupid thing and you think about how big something like that gets and how quickly if one of our pieces of media that we produce so much of if if one of those things took off in china or in india just think of the impact that's just, it's mind-blowing. and that's are you, are you aware of what's going on in Brazil and Cuba right now? Not really. Oh, it uh, would be a really cool topic for uh, you to uh, talk about on the themes uh, but, or, or come back and talk about it here. But basically, in Brazil, they're having 300,000 people marches to the capital to demand the uh, immediate... Uh, demand the immediate... Um, Re resignation of their president and uh, they want to put in a president that's going to basically wipe out uh, a lot of their taxation and uh, market regulations wow and it's uh they're called the anarcho capitalistas really yes uh, that's happening in cuba as well um not not to that not to that level because cuba is still quite uh very test yeah. It's not as bad as, as the scary American media would, would like you to have, but mm -hmm. uh, there are people, I'm talking to them on Twitter all the time, that are, and I'm saying, if Cuba is getting this, why aren't you in America? <laughs> the birthplace of freedom, as Sean Hannity would say. <laughs> why aren't you getting it if people in Brazil are getting it? That's what oh. I say. You know, like, these, these people, they... Most of these people in Brazil and Cuba, they don't have a pot to piss in, all right? Well, that's and why. they're and they're getting it. But yeah. that that I think that's why because they've you know the the most of the people here have, have been pampered. You know they they talk about you know when when you when you grow up living the way most of us have, where you know it, even the poorest among us is still better off than most of the rest of the world has been you're you're already at that you know you're already hitting rock you're hitting rock bottom a lot faster when you're one of those other people it just people warms like, my heart to see a mises.org no, sign in brazil riot marches <laughs> it, it's great but you know to to add on to that and, and also what ben was saying you know i mean it's funny when when i look at our stats i mean we just you know we just started out we're only on episode 15 at this point but you know i i look at our stats and i actually get more excited that our, our most regular non-U.S. Um, hits have been from uh, Russia and Japan. We've gotten the most on a fairly regular basis, and, and France, too. Um, but I get more excited about those 5 to 10 from those areas than I do from all the numbers that we get from the U.S. Because I'm like, wow, we're reaching people out there. Me, and and my, my uh, 
train of thought was exactly what you were saying, Ben, that, you know, all the, all it is is that spark. Just get yeah. one person out there thinking this and, and listening to us. And it, it really, it does, it warms my heart that I've seen, that I've tracked this now and I've seen that they, you know, the same numbers keep coming up from these places week after week after week. And it's like, they're listening. This is great. <laughs> Yeah, you know, but it, it is but, awesome. Yeah. But to, to lead back to what you were saying, Dave, that's the thing. It's like all it takes is that spark, but they're already so much lower than, than most of the people here are. Well, you know, it, it, goes to my, people... it goes to my point that technology is going to crush, not statism, because I don't believe the statism. I think people are still going to be statist a thousand years from now. But it's crushing this idea that we need a ruler, that, that, this, that we need this all-encompassing centralized power in control of economy, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's people that want to live off the grid. They want to, and the technology is increasing that. And that's something the government's not going to be able to regulate. They're talking about the government's trying to counteract their fascistic monopolies by saying, well, we're going to put meters on your solar panels. Okay. I'll just unhook my meat. My, I'll just unhook my solar panels when you're here. What are, what are you going to do? Come say, Hey, we know you didn't have them hooked up for, you know, Oh my bad! A squirrel ate the wire. <laughs> you know, it's that that at this point, freedom and liberty is an immovable, or is an unstoppable force, and government is no longer an immovable object. They're a crumbling object, and eventually it's going to plow through. It's just we're in that we're, we're we're you know we're in that transitional phase. You know that uh. You know, they, they want to, th you know, the, the media wants you to think, oh, socialism is getting worse and, uh, you know, communism is spreading and all these people. It's like, well, look at Brazil, 300,000 people, 300,000 people marching against the president and saying, we're going to get violent if you don't stop down or step down. <laughs> you can't kill 300,000 people in the blink of an eye and kill the idea. You only make that idea stronger. That's pretty wild. I'll have to look into that. I've seen, you know, I've seen like uh, uh, pictures of marches in Brazil, but I just figured, oh, they're mad about soccer or whatever. I didn't really, I mean, <laughs> I hate to be that way, you know, but, uh, but I've just kind of passed over it. And I didn't really even look into it, but I'll have to do that. That would make a good episode for the Freedom Fiends. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool, especially if you could have one of your Spanish speakers on to talk to someone from Cuba or Brazil or Portuguese speaker for Brazil. Yeah, one of our co-hosts is in Mexico City, and I can't remember where he's from. I think he's from Venezuela or Paraguay or somewhere, I'm not sure, Some one of the South American countries. So uh, that would be really interesting to get him talking about that. So do you want to, do you want to, do we want to shift gears and talk maybe some certain things if like, if you're hearing this and you're getting frustrated, if you're one in, someone in the audience and you're, you're debating with family, friends, whatever, on, online or, or in person or on the phone day after day, and it's wearing you down, it's beating you down. Is there anything you guys would want to maybe give them tips, maybe help steer their, their ship a little bit, um, blow some wind in their sails? Because I know for me personally, until I kind of basically threw down my sword and shield and admitted that debating is, is pointless, and I, I, I do now try to steer people into not really Socratic, but like, hey, I'm a happier person because of this. Check this out. If you don't like it, move on along with your life. If you do like it, I'm free to ask, answer any questions. <laughs> well, I, I think we've, you know, we've been talking a, a lot of a, a lot about it uh, throughout. You know, it's it really. I think I think Ben hit on something too that it really is. It's just you, you know you need to find what you're comfortable with, and 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 work with that and not worry about the people out there that may be like some of those people in new hampshire like some of the other cliquish type groups across the country that i've encountered that have that mentality that it's well if you're not doing it our way you know then you're doing it wrong there there's everybody is different and you know i i just look at it from my from my own position and you know where i was where i came from how i got there um and some of my other you know some of my other friends that I made early on in my journey that we all kind of came into this together and you know I saw the paths that they took and even so you know I, the, the most success I've had so far is with my dad I've talked about this on shows before 
Um, you know, he's the one who actually inadvertently set me down this path because he was a hardcore constitutionalist and he just wanted me to understand how horrible Obama was and that he was a Muslim and all these wonderful, you know, Tea Party-esque things. Um, <laughs> and, and that's actually what got me. I actually set out... Muslim this, socialist! <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But no, he's I, a fascist. Well, he, well, well, well in, in, in a hat tip to the fiends, I will, I will have to agree that he is a, you know, he is a liar, a socialist, and his feet do stink. Um, but that, <laughs> aside from that, <laughs> um, you know, he, he set me on that path, and I actually decided to start studying history to prove him wrong. Like, mm. that was my goal. My goal was to prove him completely wrong and say that, you know, um, you're just you're you're a tinfoil hatter. You're a crazy man. Um, and uh, it turned out, you know, I, I bypassed him on some of the political stuff. But a lot of the other things he was talking about, I was like, wait a minute, you're not so crazy. You actually there is some there is some truth here. And then I kept digging and went past him and blew past him. <laughs> and I ended up, um, you know, deciding that I, I finally admitted to myself that I, I was an anarchist. And uh, and now I've actually finally got him coming around the the the, uh, the corner. Um, he still can't get, let go of the national defense thing yet, but uh, I'm working on that. Um, but I see it with him. I see how his transitions go. So I, I, I take all that information and I say, okay, you know, this, this handful or this, or this small group of people that I know personally, every one of us took a different path. Every one of us had that one aha moment, that one thing that made it click. And it was, it was almost never forced, although I, ha I do know a couple of people that the beat it over your head approach actually did work on. So when people say, oh, you can't do that, it'll never work, it's not true. It will. Not often, but it will. But the point is that there's, everybody has that, that thing that, that, that sticks in their mind that will, that will make it click. And you just have to find that. So trying out different methods and try, you know, just, I, I've, I've also said before that for me, the realization that I will never, most likely never see the full scale change that I have envisioned in my head in my lifetime actually puts me at peace. It used to frustrate the heck out of me when I first came to, you know, when I was that angry, young, angry anarchist and I just wanted to yell to everybody and make everybody change their minds right away and they weren't getting it and I was getting so mad because I just wanted it right now. Um, when you know that that was me for the first year or so and then i finally started to realize that number one i had alienated a heck of a lot of people in my life because i was just so obnoxious about this um and so in your face that i i, I had to sit back for a second i said okay now i thought about it and i i talked to some other people and i talked to some people that have been doing this a lot longer than me and said yeah we're not going to see this anytime soon you just have to keep plugging away and i said okay that makes sense so it actually it brought me like this peace where now I it's almost like a, it's almost like a pressure release like I don't feel that pressure like I have to co keep going I have to keep going because we this has to happen before I die um so I, I'm all about you know just taking my time with people and just poking and and, and and trying different methods and find what works for each person and and also as we've discussed before that it, it really is just if, if you can go in with the mindset, especially if you're going to go in front of a group of people, even as, as some social function and you're willing to talk about this stuff um, or if it's on social media, wherever it is, if you can go in with a mindset that, you know, as Ben and I have both said, you know, your, tar your target audience isn't that one person. It's whoever else is watching. And you can also stick to the one mind at a time principle that I, I really try to keep in my head. Like it's a mantra I say to myself. Like anytime I, I think about getting discouraged, I keep saying, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this one mind at a time. I'm not trying to get a whole group of people at once to understand. I'm just looking for that one person who's willing to pause and ask questions and, and think. And, and that's it. And like, that's a, I do a happy dance when I find those people, <laughs> you know, I'm in a, I'm in a crowd or if I'm, or if I'm online in a, in a, in a large group and you get that one person who like private messages you and wants to ask more questions. It's like, yes, success. <laughs> so, uh, that, that's, you know, it's like, it's, like you said, Dave, I mean, it's, it's easy to get discouraged. It, it really is. But if, if you can keep in mind that it's not, you know, if it happens before I die, freaking great, I will be ecstatic. But you know, if you keep in mind that there's a good chance it's not going to happen, but you, but as we've also talked about, you, you need to do your part now. You can't just push it off on the next generation and say, well, they'll do it. They'll get to it. You know, everybody's got to, if you really want it, if you really believe in freedom, if you really want to live free um, completely, I mean, we can all live as, as free as we possibly can right now, you know, living a, an agorist type lifestyle, uh, which I try to do. 
um, but you still have the, that fear of them breathing down your neck um, at, for a certain, you know, anytime you cross, as, as was talked about much earlier in the show, you know, if you cross any government agent on a bad day, um, you never know what kind of power they will try to use against you. So, you know, just, just keep thinking that it's, it, it's tough, but if you really want it, you, you got to put in some work. So try to uh, diversify, F find what works for you and find what works for other people and combine those two and just go out there and, and try to have fun with it. You know, there's one more thing, too. Uh, everything you said, I, I agree with. Um, there was something else I was thinking of, too, though. You know, here in America, I heard this as a sermon in a church in probably about 1982 or 83. And so I'm going to heavily adopt, ad adapt it uh, for my own purposes. But um, there was a guy, the, the, the guy who was giving this sermon, he made the comparison. He said, uh, you think about cathedrals that were built in Europe during the Dark Ages. And this is a time when, you know, um, it would take all the resources that a small town could come up with, uh, with, you know, uh, uh, both taxation and voluntary gifts and everything that they could do to come up with enough money to buy the, the bronze it would take to cast a bell. And they would do it. They would cast a bell not even having a belfry to put the bell in. But they were doing this because they believed in a real long-term victory of Christianity. And this, is, this was the guy's story that he was telling in this, in this sermon. He says, now, so it would take, honestly, it would take generations to build the great cathedrals that were, that were being built in like, you know, 1200 and, and 800 A.D. and 1200 A.D. and 1400 A.D. It would take multiple generations to build those things. And he said, now you look across America and, you know, a church pops up and they, they buy a, a metal frame. They come out, they pour a slab on the ground that's poured in one day. They come out with a metal frame. They throw that thing up in a couple of weeks. They toss a roof on it and you have a church. Bang, it's done. And if the church ever fails or the church wants to grow and move to a different location or whatever, it's a teardown building. It costs almost nothing to build it. There's, all, you know, there's no structure there. You can just tear it down, build another one. It's no big deal. So much so that, like, if you're going to build up a pharmacy at a, at a, at the, at a corner, you know, the, the, the uh, brand name, let's say it's CVS, well, CVS will tear down a perfectly good building to build a building that looks exactly like all the other CVSs because they have a theme. Or if it's, you know, one particular restaurant, they'll tear down a perfectly good building to build one that's in their theme just to get it to look the way they want. And it's built so cheaply that when they're done with it and they move on, the next company that comes in will tear that one down and build another one because construction is so cheap. But the cathedrals... In, in because the the mindset in America today is always thinking short term. We want liberty now. We want it in our lifetime. We want it right now. We want the government to collapse right now. I want all my rights right now. And if I don't have it, I'm going to stomp my feet and cry until a cop hauls me away. You know, and that's kind of the mentality that we have. We have this spoiled uh, thought pattern that says if I don't get what I want right now, I'm going to scream and cry until I get it. But that wasn't the thought pattern of people during the Dark Ages or the so-called Dark Ages. They thought, you know, if all we can afford to do is get enough together that we can get the bronze, then maybe we'll have a bell for our children. And maybe our children can get enough and they can build, you know, and they're, they believed that to a certain extent their, their, their you know, eternity was based on whether or not they had a good cathedral and they could please God with this fabulous building, you know, uh, and, and convince the heathen to come and be part of their uh, religion. They, they believed, rightly or wrongly, um, you know, that was their reality, that they had to do that for their eternity. And so they were building for generations. And I really think that we need to realize that in our minds, that we're not just building something for this generation. We really are laying groundwork. And, and you know, there's been, maybe we're above groundwork. Maybe we're doing the plumbing right now. I don't know how to make the metaphor exactly correct. <laughs> you know, because Spooner and we got Locke and we got all these other people that have came before us and Minkin and all these really great thinkers that we're, that we're relying upon. And so I don't know where we're at in this building, 
but I don't want to just throw up a cheap tin metal, you know, a cheap tin uh, roof on a on a on a thing that could be magnificent. I would rather take our time and get it right, and not just have the next wind that comes through blow it down. I don't know that, if I. That's no, you nailed it right there. That's that was, <laughs> that was that was awesome. And you know, I, people always say, "Oh, there's a failed state over there. That's anarchy. Go 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 look at that, and that's what you'll get." And I say, yeah, but anarchy is when people don't want a state. And that's not what's happening in that area. You have people that want a state. They have no state, but they want one. Mm -hmm. So that's not the problem. You know, uh, to quote Larkin Rose, government's just an idea in everyone's head. It doesn't exist. Yeah. And the, your belief is the only thing propping it up. If tomorrow no one believed that the government was legitimate, no one would pay their taxes, they wouldn't be able to afford enough people to enforce that idea, and no one would work for it to do that, they would, it would disappear overnight. So what you said was right. We have to build people who, or not build people, we have to show people that uh, we, we can be free. Uh, you know, uh, to quote um, <clears throat> Henry David Thoreau, don't, don't tell a man he's wrong. Show a man he's wrong. Yeah. To paraphrase. Uh, and uh, men believe what they can see. You know, man believes what he can see. And, and you know, that's why there's people, that, you know, that's why there's so many atheists out there. They, they can't see God. If they could see God, there wouldn't be any atheists out there. So is you just carry that sentiment over to pretty much everything you're trying to convey to someone. Don't don't tell people they're wrong show people they're wrong show them why they're wrong by action not by you know anger and hate you know i have a, a t-shirt idea i'm working on it's uh destroy fear with hate or destroy fear with love yeah and, and that's i think that's what we have to do is is destroy this this fear that's pretty much why the state exists is because of fear I mentioned oh, cryptocurrencies before and, and uh, as opposed to in the Fed, and that's kind of the same theme that I, that I try to push on that, that it's, it's not so much, you know, um, complaining about the existing system. I mean, I complain about the existing system all the time, but uh, the real answer is in creating a thing that can go around the existing system and bypass it. And, you know, the argument between, um, was it, I've brought this up a couple times here lately, the argument between Rothbard and, um, oh, I can't remember the other guy that, uh, that was one of the early thinkers on agorism. Um, they, they, Proud Han. No, no, yeah. no, uh, no, no, it was, uh, a, a Rothbard and, uh, oh yeah, I just read it about, what's his uh, name, Shock, Shocken Con or Conkin, Conkin, yes. Yeah. Conkin, okay. Yeah. Anyway, um. And, and, of course, they were arguing about it when the technology doesn't exist that exists today. So they were, uh, they, their argument, I would say, is not really all that valid because they couldn't imagine the things that we have today. But So Karl Marx wasn't right in 18,000 years ago? <laughs> you're, is that what you're telling me, that his stuff doesn't stand the tale of time, that the world's not just full of factories and evil owners? <laughs> but I really so, think, sorry, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> but I really think that, you know, um, these cutting edge things, you know what, what uh, Cody Wilson is doing? Cody is such yeah. an interesting person anyway. But then, you know, he says, all right, so the government says you can't, you can't, uh, you can't make your own gun. All right, well, okay, here's the plans. Now they're on the Internet. You can't take them back. And the government says, oh, you can't do that. You can't turn those loose on the Internet. Too late. Yeah. It's done. You can't un. You can't take the pee out of the pool. It's in there. You can't. <laughs> it's it's not coming out. You can get mad at me all you want. It's already done. You know. All right. So whatever you do, you can't create these horrible ghost guns. Yeah, you can. Here's the printer. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Here's the milling machine that does it. Now what are you going to do? Oh no. Well, now there's now we realize the software is in existence. There's milling machines all over the world. Any good milling machine can do this now. Now you've got the software for it. It's it's literally the genie bottle situation, and you can't stuff it back in, or the you know the urine in the pool. It's the same thing, and that's the that's what we're doing, 
we're going out there with cryptocurrencies and we're going out there with you know printable guns and we're going out there with you know milling machines that can that can create the stuff that the government and I've said this before and this goes right in with the with the seeds of liberty and the Johnny Appleseed concept I've said before that you know we've got some really smart people who are anarcho uh, capitalists and if we can get somebody who can cross breed marijuana so that it grows as abundantly as like dandelions and kudzu then you just, kudzu yeah. I heard yeah, that exactly. and I said I'm from Alabama I said kudzu <laughs> yeah yeah you, you see it down here it takes over a whole forest you, you know? can't get rid of it you have to yeah. even if you burn the whole field the seeds just they get back in the air and then they oh yeah got kudzu again it, uh, it, they, they plant it to feed deer I'll tell you something else is um, uh, one of those morning glories. I planned. I, I used to have a garden before I went on the road and we started living in our RV. I had a. Uh, I had for years. I had a garden, and one year I planted uh, morning glories, and they're beautiful, but they don't last very long. And then they. Then you've got this plant that's useless and it turns brown. And it's ugly, but one planting of morning glories, your your whole neighborhood is going to have more morning glories forever because those things just seed so abundantly. And if somebody was to create a hybrid version of pot with maybe it's not the greatest THC levels in the world, but it's got a moderate THC level, but it seeds like mad, and then just get it out there and plant it between every, you know, in the between the lanes of every freeway, underneath every overpass, just, you know, get into uh, state parks and just sow that stuff in state state parks. Ben, have you ever heard of uh, what's happened to uh, psilocybin cubenzies? Oh, the mushroom? Uh, no. Oh, okay, so when the cops confiscate a ton of it uh, from like uh, someone who's growing a, has a lab and growing a lot of it, they get it all over their clothes. The spore, <laughs> they get the spores all over their clothes. They get it all over their badge, their gun, the cars, the vans that they're uh, in San Francisco. They've tried. <laughs> they've tried to stop mushrooms. Uh, uh, people from selling them so badly that they have inadvertently spread it. They are so common that you cannot stop it. That's why. California had to pass the law that as long as you're not growing it, it's not illegal. If you find it in the, you find it on the side of the road or in the forest, you can pick it all you want. Wow. Uh, so if you go to the San Francisco Police Department, there's a field beside it, and this is Terrence McKenna's story, not mine. Uh, at certain parts of the year, the entire field is full of psilocybin cubenzies. <laughs> they've they've actually had to put guards up because people will go out there with bags and pick it. Wow. So. This this whole idea it's a spore like you're you're saying is you know maybe not with marijuana I I, I don't think that's as conscious expanding as, as mushrooms, but uh, but with you know the spores like you can't defeat it, like you know that's you know if one one mushroom creates a million spores how do you stop that that gets on the officer's <laughs> clothes he goes home his wife watches watches his clothes now the spores are all over all their clothes their daughter goes fr frolicking through the backyard the spores go everywhere so. There's no way to stop it. I really yeah. think that's how we defeat laws, though, is we just create so much outside of law that the law becomes silly, you know, and then... Well, that's how prohibition ended, right? Yeah, it, yeah. They couldn't afford to enforce it anymore, and it was so publicly... You know, and that, that's just another thing to go on another topic. It just doesn't... Like, that's how stupid people are. They see that the alcohol prohibition didn't work, right? <laughs> But they think that drug prohibition of all drugs now will work in some way. For some reason, I don't know why. But as we've talked in past episode, all it is is the only reason the drug enforcement agency still exists is because you have a welfare boondoggle that the government will not end because that is a voting class that they are not willing to drop. Yeah. Yeah. You know, on, on drugs, uh, I saw uh, uh, with the horrible shooting that took place lately, um, and the different, you know, people, especially on the left, that are saying, "Oh, this is why we need outlaw guns." And I saw a meme with the with the little baby who's got that funny look on his face, and it says, "You know, if outlaw something to the effect of if outlawing guns would get rid of uh, shootings like this, all we have to do is outlaw them. Well, then why don't we just outlaw, you know, uh, methamphetamine and heroin? Why don't we just outlaw them? That way, the drug problem would go away." And the kid's got that funny look on his face, like what? You know, yeah. <laughs> what? Why don't we outlaw um, higher learning and and? Uh, yeah. You know, we'd have the smartest people in the world if there was a vicious crackdown on learning stuff. 
Well, I, I, I think the, you know, the, the, the planting of things like that, um, I, I think there, there was a group that, I can't remember the name of them, but they did it a couple of years ago. It was essentially a, gr a guerrilla gardening tour with, uh, with cannabis seeds. And they were, go they were just trampsing all, like, all, all over the place. I think it started out, um, they, did it on, they did it in D.C., and people would just walk, and they were marching all together, and they were literally just throwing seeds, because they actually do, like, um, marijuana seeds actually catch and grow pretty easily. <laughs> um, you just throw, you know, you, so that's what people were doing. They were just on a march, and they were just, every once in a while, people would just throw out handfuls of seeds, and just well, throw them weed. out the field. Well, weeds grow throw, fast, right? Well, exactly. You just throw them out everywhere, and it, yeah, to get a, a more concentrated effort with that would be, would be wonderful, because... You know, Dave, you said it's it's they're they're not as psychoactive as 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 mushrooms, but I don't think that's the point. The point is just to to get it. I, I said it, conscious yeah. expanding is a different yeah. theory, but sure. no, I, I get you. But to, to to get just to get it out there, as Ben said, when you when it becomes so much, they they can't. They, what are they going to do about it? Becomes it? unenforceable. It's, liter yeah. it's literally everywhere. You can walk out your front door and pick it off your sidewalk. Or the little patch of lawn in front of your house, if you have, you know, if you're if you're in a place like me on Long Island, um, and uh, you, what are they going to do? It's literally everywhere. Well, they're they're not going to well, have a GMO, choice. GMO uh, GMO weed just got made by Monsanto, so let's just hope maybe there's some twisted <laughs> weed addict up at a. Uh, not that you can be addicted to weed, but some twisted weed uh, well, proponent actually, up there in most most Monsanto that has created this super strain of weed that can't be, you know, it well, just grows see, like actually, wildfire. Not, not, not to get not to go down that path, but actually, as soon as you said that, the, the first thing that popped into my head was a bad thing, obviously. And <laughs> my thought was, yeah, they're create they're creating their own marijuana. Believe so it they... or not, not everyone that works for evil corporations no, no, is evil. I know, the, I know that's a crazy. That's you know... not that's not the point. I, no, I, no, I I'm could, just picking I could, at you. I could easily I could easily see them doing that so that when their seeds get out there and cross pollinate, they can claim, pat. You know, they they already do that with farmers. <laughs> They're, they're, they're claiming patent violations for people's for their seeds blowing onto other people's property. They could, they'll do that with the marijuana seeds, and that's, you know, that would be a very insidious uh, thing by the government to do, to use, <laughs> use Monsanto to stop, the, <laughs> stop the, pro, uh, the proliferation of weed around the country. <laughs> uh, but that's a topic for another day. Um, but, yeah, I, I, think these, I think these things, that, th these things are great, doing out there and just, you know, we talked about this last week, actually, on the show about of, of ways to fight back through noncompliance and just... You know, going out there and living your life and, and doing stuff like this, like you see these ridiculous laws and you can think of a way to circumvent them and you can find a group of people that are willing to help you out, go for it. You know, the more people that are out there doing this stuff and just simply disobeying, um, it, these, these laws will eventually all have to crumble. They won't have a choice. There be There's nothing to enforce at that point, you know, and I, I think to, to get back to just quickly what, what was, was said earlier about the, you know, the... The, the timeline and everything and, and not, you know, Ben said about not putting up the house too quickly. That's something that I've always, um, you know, since I, since I got out of my angry stage, I've, <laughs> I've said that, you know, and I get in arguments with people who say, you know, you, if the state falls and, and right now and I'll be happy and, and, and then, you know, whoever's not ready, screw them. It's like, you know, it's not going to work on that level. Like you, we, we need some more numbers, you know, like you said, Ben, if, even if we have a, even if we have a million right now, that's still, not nearly enough to to really make it a, a, a nationwide change. Um, so I I, I always well, just look at how much press coverage the the Liberland guys got. That's think about how many people saw that. Yeah. Like. Yeah. See, millions, I, I millions. I don't really know anymore because I don't check anything but alternative media, so I don't actually know what's getting out to the mainstream media anymore. <laughs> well, Fox, CNN, ABC, all of them covered it, uh, so. I mean, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but sure. they're laughed at. I'm sure they're laughed at. I mean, I'm sure they, they love when the You when the can laugh all you want. You know, what did, what did Gandhi say? First they laugh at you, then they they hate so, you, then they hurt you, and then they join you. The, uh, no, then you win. That was the last yeah, line yeah. of that. But, no. but yeah, so anyway, I, th I guess we should uh, get wrapping up now. Um, but So, Ben, do you want to just go ahead and plug away everything that, uh, you know, whatever? <laughs> sure. Um mm -hmm. If if anybody is not familiar with the Bad Quaker podcast, I did somewhere around 400 episodes or so, and they are available on Torrent Feed, uh, but they're also available in an archive form. Um, currently, they're at badquaker.com, and you can dig through the, the, the files there and get them all, but uh, that's going to eventually disappear at some point in time. 
So if you get over to Art of Not Being Governed, they have a mirror of all of the episodes over there. Uh, if you just go through their uh, links, uh, you can find it in there, badquaker.com's uh, uh, archive of all the, like I say, some, some, somewhere close to 400 episodes. Uh, and then currently I'm working with the Freedom Fiends on mo somewhere around 30 to 35 radio stations. It changes back and forth every few days, but somewhere between 30 and 35 radio stations. We're on seven days a week. Uh, one of those shows every week is a, a best of, so so we have six you know active shows every week. I'm generally on the weekends. I, I generally do Saturday and Sunday at noon uh, Central Time, and we we try to have an upbeat show because since we're on the radio, we're also you know on the internet at freedomfiends.com. But since we're actually on the radio, and especially the weekend show where we're in the middle of the day, so you're getting folks going to picnics and you're getting people you know between go, coming from church going to the VFW lodge or or whatever. So we try to keep things on an upbeat. Uh, not so much crying about the state or not so much condemning the state and not so much hitting hardcore, you know, anarchist uh, theory and, and really getting into that. We try to keep things as light as possible, yet while baiting the hook with as much as we can do at the same time. <laughs> so that's that's kind of the purpose of the Freedom Fiends is to just constantly, you know, keep it light, keep it upbeat, throw the hook out there and just keep baiting them and baiting them, almost like chumming the water, you know, for <laughs> for, for better fishing. Uh, we're just out there like like in the movie Jaws, we're just dumping blood into the waters, hoping somebody will come to the surface. <laughs> and that's kind of the, yeah, actually, that's a good one. That's a lot better what the Freedom Fiends do. We're not throwing out hooks with bait on it. We're just dumping chum into the, into the ocean <laughs> for the sharks. You know? We're trying our best to make free, feeding frenzies happen. Um, yeah, I, I, I enjoy every time you and Bill are on. That's, that's I, I listen when I can, but I directly listen to when you and Bill are on. Bill is one of my favorite human beings of all time, and I've never met him. I want to. <laughs> He's pretty cool. We have a really good crew. I mean, if you really get into there and you start thinking about, it, you know, like Chandler's been, he's done a lot of different projects. He's, his face and his name are not real well known like some of the other people, but man, Chandler is solid and he has been doing this for a long time, making a lot of media. And we got Derek J up there in uh, Keene, New Hampshire, and Der and you know Derek is solid and he's every Monday night. Uh, so let's see, Sunday night, Monday morning, he does the show. And uh, we got Randy England, who is a writer for Lou Rockwell, and he's also an attorney, an active attorney. Um, so he's like super smart, you know. Um, and then we've got Bill Bupert, who is a man of unbelievable, uh, just he, he has talent in so many directions. And a thinker, like, I mean, it's just, it, it bruises my brain every time I talk to him because it forces <laughs> me to think, you know. I really enjoy that. And then we've got, you know, it's just a real eclectic group of people. We've got people in Scotland. We've got, got people in Mexico City. We've got, uh, and it's expanding. Uh, Michael Dean, who is, you know, the crazy person behind the, the, the uh, screen on all this stuff, he's constantly working on getting new people into this. So he's got several people, you know, in the wings that he's coaching and trying to bring into a position where he can bring them into it. And that's the whole purpose of the Freedom Fiends is to not only chum those waters like we were saying, like I was saying, but also to train up people so that, you know, um, what Michael says is the, uh, it, it makes it bus proof. So that if he's walking down the street one day and a bus takes him out, hey, it's just going to scatter like we're talking about. It's going to scatter the seeds and there's going to be spores all over everything and, and 15 more shows will crop up. So, you know, if something happens to take him out, we're just going to we're going to spread it's going to be like cutting the head off of the hydra we're just going to sprout six more you know so anyway that's what we're trying to do i don't know how long i'm going to stay with it i really need to uh you know to back out and just enjoy my retirement uh sit on the beach but uh as long as these things are still in my brain you know you just got to spit them out you can't you can't sit yeah, on yeah it would be a crime yeah yeah <laughs> It eats you from the inside if you don't say anything. Yeah, that's uh, you know what I said the other day uh, to to a few friends who were like, "Man, would you just stop?" I'm like, I really don't care how many friends I lose. I don't really care about how many family members disown me, or how many people think I'm crazy. 
I'm not gonna stop. I'm not. I'm not gonna stop. I don't care. The yeah. Fe- you- the fear of losing friends and family is is has left me. When you know you have right on your side, it's really difficult to then stop and be you know be quiet and say nothing. Oh well, yeah. Look at Martin Luther. Yeah. <laughs> the courage it took to do what he did, and everyone had did that had who had done that previous to him was. <laughs> brutally murdered by the, the church so you 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 either have to make your stand or 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 cower yeah yeah well first of all i i would just like to thank ben so much for coming on with us tonight um we uh we really appreciate it um for anybody who who has who doesn't listen to the fiends or doesn't know about the fiends i would highly recommend you checking them out uh any way you can uh, that's actually how I be, got to know about Ben. Uh, I started listening to The Fiends uh, late last year, and I pretty much haven't missed an episode since. Um, again, my, my situation is a little different than most people. I spend six to ten hours a day walking dogs and driving between stops, so I have lots of time to listen to podcasts, uh, which I do all day long. Um, and I, like, like uh, Dave, uh, I'm always extra happy when uh, you were on the show. Um, I actually, uh, unfortunately, never got a chance to listen to your your Bad Quaker podcast, although I do now uh, seed torrents for the fiends, so I have every one of your episodes downloaded to my computer, <laughs> and that is the next run I am going to start on. I was actually very... I've listened I, to a few. I was, well, I was very... The, the very first one I listened to, because I, I just started seeding a couple days ago, because I, I heard Michael say something about it again. I'm like, I gotta get, I gotta get on doing this. So I went and did it. And uh, when yours popped up, the, the, first, the first listing is like a, a quadruple zero, and it's just a bunch of your, I, I guess, tiny little things that you started off with, maybe. And the very first one was about, it, about dogs. And I was like, <laughs> this is great, because that's, dogs are my life. You know, I, run a, I, I own a pet sitting company, so I'm, I'm with dogs pretty much all day long. I, I board them at my house and walk them during the day. So when I heard that, I'm like, oh, this is great. This is a great way to start. And uh, I'm very excited to listen to, listen to more. So, uh, so again, thank you very much for coming on. Um, people, check out the fiends. <laughs> thank you. Uh-oh. Yeah, it was a delight. We're yes. gonna have to have you back on uh, on, on a, <clears throat> another episode one day to talk about something else. Yeah. Yep. I'm available. All right. Great. Well, thank you everybody for watching. This has been the Seeds of Liberty podcast. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and all of that can be found at theseedsofliberty.com. Um, Dave, anything else you want to add? Plant or... seeds, you know. And you know what I said last week, uh, you know, a little spark of truth can burn an entire forest of lies. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a good one. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thank hey. you for listening and watching. Peace.